I'm going to give the overview of the Genesis um, simulations thread um, and I'll try and stick to time because um, we have the pleasure of Darren giving us a, a hands-on demo towards the end of the talk so he's going to show us some new developments in, in Tau. <clears throat> so um, just in case you're not aware of what Genesis is, um, we're a, a team that are focused on um, providing theoretical simulations um, to Astro 3D so we can study galaxy formation and evolution across cosmic time from the epoch of reionization. And as you've already heard, we have very close links with, with Kath and her team um, to the present day. And we do this using a combination of methods. So we use very large and body simulations of cosmologically interesting volumes. And we couple those to uh, semi-analytical models to study galaxy formation. And we also use hydrodynamical simulations of systems that span from, say, dwarf scales up to the most massive clusters. And we do this in close collaboration with a number of the big overseas simulations teams. Um, who are we? Well, the, the three CIs are Darren, Stu, and myself. Uh, we also have um, several postdocs, uh, so Pascal, Alahi, and Lillian, um, Simon Much, and Manadeep. I'll note that both Pascal and Simon are on, are on paternity leave at the moment, so I guess we've grown as a result of that as well. Um, and I also note that Pascal will be moving on um, at the end of this month to, to start a new position at, at Pawsey. So altogether, there's probably about 25 to 30 people at any one time involved in the project. Um, so a lot of what we do um, is very much focused on these very large n-body simulations um, and um, I've shown some variation on this figure before but this is a new work that we've been very much focused on this year so we've we've um, been utilizing the new um, upgrade at NCI the the Guardi um, supercomputer to start running very large n-body simulations and one of the other things that we've been doing is migrating over to a new code so we had been using gadget um, for a long time to do these very big runs, but we've started using the Swift code, um, which has several advantages, one of which is that we can start to scale our problems up much more easily than we could with Gadget. So um, one, one of the reasons that it's attractive is that we can do bigger jobs, and the other one is that we can run our structure finding in line. So this is the Velociraptor code that Pascal spent a lot of time. And I guess our two um, flagship uh, simulations um, the first is a, a, I'll order a 300 megaparsec box, um, 5,200 cubed. Um, and the focus there is on being able to analyze the very early universe all the way through to the present day. So it's good for looking at the first sources of uh, reionization um, in at redshifts of 10 and above, uh, all the way down to looking at galaxy dynamics and satellite dynamics in the local universe. And the other one that's very useful is a more of a cosmological volume. It's equivalent to the millennium volume. Um, and the, the goal there is to look at large scale uh, structure and environmental studies. So it's very good for pulling out say H1 mass functions or stellar mass functions. Um, and I would like to highlight the, the role of a couple of students, uh, uh, Rhys and, and Lucy, they've been absolutely crucial in a lot of this work as well. So I think they've been doing good work. Um, uh, so there are the simulations that we're running. Um, I'll just give some kind of context as well. So. I talked a little, little bit about SAMS, um, and we were, were, were blessed to have um, several very um, capable people involved in this. And uh, we have uh, an array of SAMS that we used in order to study different kinds of problems. They all have, have, the, have their relative strengths. So for example, Simon Much is the developer of the Meraxes code, which is what we use to um, make predictions for the EOR. Um, we have uh, Sage and Dark Sage by Darren and, and Adam, which are are ideal for, um, say, in Adam's case, looking at the structure, internal structure of galaxies. And then the sharp code, which is being developed by Claudia, is open source, very scalable, and it's got lots and lots of different physical recipes in there that we can use to, to explore galaxy formation. There's also a fairly vigorous uh, um, hydro program going on. So we have these close links with the likes of Illustrious and Eagle, um, but we're also running a lot of simulations in-house that kind of fill in the gaps. We can't use Illustrious and Eagle for everything. Um, you know, they have their strengths, but then, then you know, we also need to, to, to study particular problems that are of interest to us. Um, so Lillian's been very, very useful there as well, helping with this project. 
Um, so I'll now um, highlight a few um, uh, projects that are ongoing at the various nodes. Um, one project being led by Yisheng, a PhD student over at Melbourne. It's uh, some very nice work. So the idea here is to extend the mass resolution of our very large n-body simulations down to the very low scales that we need in order to resolve um, atomic line cooling in, in high redshift halos. And so as an example of this, when we run a large n-body simulation, we're basically limited by the volume and the mass resolution. And so in order to get very high mass resolution, we tend to compensate that by going to smaller volumes. And what Yisheng has been doing is using a technique now, um, based on Monte Carlo trees. So we can uh, augment the n-body merger trees that we have with these Monte Carlo trees and start to, to populate down to lower and lower mass scales. So this is the, the halo mass function over here at two different times, redshifts of 10 and 5. And you can see the um, curve here corresponds to what we get from a very um, a relatively small but very high resolution box compared to a larger volume but coarser resolution box. And with, um, with Yi Sheng's technique, we can start to populate halos down to lower and lower masses and get a faithful representation of what the mass function looks, looks like. So the physical implication of that is that when we look at something like the ionization fraction as a function of redshift, um, if we don't do um, what Yi Sheng has been doing, then we don't get it as well as if we do do it. So we can actually get a much better recovery of the, uh, the, of the ionization fraction as a function of redshift. Um, so that's very nice work. Um, uh, some more work that's been done over at University of Melbourne is by, has been led by James Davis, and he's using the, I think it's the blue tide simulation, I'm pretty sure it is based on the numbers he's given me. Um, but the idea here is to look for direct evidence of um, um, the EOR. So the idea here is that when you're looking for the EOR, it's a very faint signal, and it's also complicated by the presence of these radio foregrounds that Kath's talked about. And so what James has done is he's gone into the blue tide simulation and, and found the bright galaxies within the simulation. And the idea is that you can then do a kind of a stacking experiment. So if you just look at a, um, the, uh, the brightness temperature that you get as a function of uh, projected distance from the source, if you have only one source, then you can see that it's quite noisy and it's a very faint signal. But if you start stacking, then you can actually start to get stronger and strong, stronger signals. And so what you should then get is a, a much better defined central trough in the brightness temperature and a clear signature of reionization. Um, so that's with a quite a clean signal. And as you start to introduce the effects of foregrounds, um, they will complicate what you're actually seeing. Um, but you can actually start to remove these foregrounds by looking at this in Fourier space. So um, you can parameterize this uh, um, in Fourier space by looking at the gradient. Um, so you can go from a, a Q equals zero case where you've got no foregrounds up to a Q equal one case where you have maximal foregrounds. And then the idea here is that the, these are kind of some test cases that James has done and you can see what happens if you have these foregrounds um, and you can actually see that if you have say moderate um, contamination by foregrounds you get a pretty good signal but even in the case of the maximal contamination then you can still get a signal that's there at about the 1.5 sigma level. Um, let me move on then to some work that's been led by uh, Diane um, over at Swinburne and she's been working with Darren on developing a new SAGE model an extension of Darren's um, semi little model. This one's called is called Dusty Sage, and the idea here is that um, Diane is looking at the various sources sources of dust that are implicit in, in galaxy formation, and tr then trying to make predictions that can be compared with observational data sets. So, for example, um, you can have dust formed in type two supernovae, and um, you can have dust growth within molecular clouds. You can have uh, AGB AGB stars forming dust. And by capturing all these different processes and embedding them within SAGE, then Diane's able to make predictions for what the dust mass function should look like as a function of time. So we're going from a redshift of zero up here all the way to redshift of seven, I believe, down here. Um, and um, the data points here are observational data sets, um, for example, from the Herschel or up, up here, you're looking at more at submillimeter galaxies. And you can see that Diane's now able to get a pretty good agreement with um, some of the observational data sets based on, on the modeling that she's been doing. So this work has appeared on Astro PH. I'm not sure whether it's been accepted yet, um, but I know that there's some additional work that Diane's been doing. So rather than looking at global measures like dust mass functions, she's able to now go in and start identifying sources by their morphology. So this plot here shows the bulge to total ratio as a function of the star formation rate in different stellar mass spins. So from you know uh, quite high stellar masses up here down to relatively low stellar masses down here. And she finds that dust-rich galaxies tend to be metal-rich and star-forming spirals, whereas the dust-poor galaxies are, are the opposite, kind of pretty much as you'd expect. 
So this is some very nice work that's in preparation. Diane's also been working on some um, a, a new tool to look at the SEDs um, as a result of the, the infrared emission. So this is called Mentari, and I guess watch this space. Oh, I see Manadi tells me that it's been accepted. Thanks, Manadi. Um, so we will now shift focus to work that's um, going on at UWA. And so this is some work that's been led by PhD student Karima. She's close to finishing her PhD at the moment. And she's been working with Claudia on looking at the H1 halo mass function relation, or H1 halo mass relation rather than mass function relation. Um, so uh, the idea here is that you want to understand how much cold gas or neutron atomic hydrogen there is as a function of the, the halo mass. Um, and so one of the things that she's been doing is to try and take or to take observational inferences for what this relation should look like and then compare it to the models. So she's been looking at some work by Guo where they were stacking um, halo masses from SDSS and H1 masses from alfalfa um, and reconstructing what the halo mass function might look like, the H1 um, halo mass relation might look like. So this is what you get if you look at everything up here. So this is what Guo were recovering. Um, there's also some work by Obulgin where they're um, doing a more statistical um, estimate. And so this is what they get up here. And then if you do the same kind of exercise with shark, you see something that looks like this. So you get pretty good agreement down here, you get pretty good agreement up here, but there is a discrepancy here. And so that's actually something that um, Karima will be looking at in future work. But the idea here is that it probably relates to just the difficulty of associating galaxies with groups um, and, uh, and H1 as a result of that. Um, but if you go and look in the models directly and see what kind of um, um, predictions are coming straight from the models, then you see something that looks very much like this. So if you focus on the the points here, the dark points, um, this is giving an indication of a scatter. So trying to understand, understand what drives this scatter is quite an interesting thing. And people often say that the physics is actually in the scatter. And um, you'll notice that there's a difference here. That's because of the te technique that um, Garimi uses to increase the, the dynamic range of the simulations. We're stacking simulations together, 10 minute marks. So, okay, thanks Lydia. Um, so just very quickly, um, you can get some raw predictions, but what you really want to understand is what, what are the physical processes that are driving it. So that's one of the things that Karima has been doing. The first thing that she looked at was what the effect of the spin angular momentum of uh, the, the, the halos might have an effect on, on the kind of, um, on how much H1 you might find within these systems. And up here you find quite um, uh, high spin systems. Down here you're looking at lower spin systems, and you can see that the high spin systems tend to have greater H1 masses associated with them. Down here, um, Green has been looking at the effect of the amount of substructure within the halo, and you can see that it's relatively insensitive down here and relatively flat, but up here you can see that there's more of a trend. So you're getting more of a trend with halo mass rather than um, in the vertical direction. And this dependency tends to be seen across the entire um, redshift, or at least the redshift range zero to two. Um, and then the, the final spotlight before I move on to, before I pass over to Darren, just very quickly, this is some very nice work that Lillian's been leading over the last couple of years, looking at the properties of H1 intervening absorbers. So trying to make contact with the ASCAP flash survey. She's been working with the Eagle team and extracting data sets from the Eagle simulations and computing things that we can compare directly to um, observations. And she's been using some nice techniques for going from the, the raw predictions from the simulations into things that are actually um, make contact with observations. So trying to extract H1 and H2 fractions. Um, I'll also note she's doing some um, new simulations in order to, to kind of flesh out what um, to, to fill in gaps, as I was talking about earlier on. But I guess that the key plot here is probably this plot here, which shows the probability density as a function of the covering fraction. So the idea is that you're picking out very dense gas. I think in this case, Lillian's been assuming about 10 to the 20 per cubic or per per, um, per square centimeter as the, the column depth. Um, and so this is just giving an indication of how the 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 probability density varies as a function of redshift and um, from the magenta corresponds to redshift zero. So you can see that it's quite peaked at relatively small systems. Um, and as you go towards higher redshifts, it becomes more extended like that. So this is some work that Lillian's in the process of finishing up. I'm mindful that I need to move on to Darren. Um, but very before I do so, the one thing I'll note is that, um, well, actually, this is the summary. It's basically what I was saying beforehand, but there's lots of good work going on. So I think I should pass to Darren now. Thank you.